morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all our speakers, chairs, and the wonderful audiences of ACNS webinars in different parts of the world. Welcome back to yet another edition of very informative lectures for you. The speaker for the first session of today's webinar is our honored guest, who is also the president of the Congress of Neurological Surgeons from the USA, Professor Nicholas Bambakidis. Professor Bambakidis is a neurosurgeon at the University Hospitals and director of the University Hospitals Neurological Institute. He is a Vice Chairman, Clinical Affairs for Neurological Surgery and Professor in Department of Neurological Surgery and Radiology at the Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine as well as Director Cerebrovascular and Skull Based Surgery, UH Neurological Institute. His special interests include Cerebrovascular Surgery, Cervical Spine Surgery, Endovascular Surgery and Skull Based Surgery. He has authored and co-authored more than 50 papers and half a dozen invited reviews and editorials in peer-reviewed journals. He has edited three major textbooks on skull base and craniocervical spinal surgery. And we're extremely honored to have him today at our webinars to be a speaker. And, and he's going to talk about contemporary management of giant aneurysms. The speaker for the second session of today is our honored guest from Burdenko Institute, Russia, Professor Nikolai Konvalov. Professor Konvalov is a Vice Director of Science and Chief of Spinal Neurosurgery Department at the Burdenko Neurological Institute in Moscow, Russia. He is a corresponding member of the Russian Academy of Sciences, President of the Russian Association of Spinal Surgeons, Board Member of the Russian Association of Neurosurgeons, Member of the ENS Spine Section Panel, ENS Training Committee and WFNS Spine Committee. He successfully hosted the first ever ENS training course in Moscow and from 2019, he holds the office of the ENS board member responsible for continuous medical education and guidelines. We are extremely honored to have him today at our webinars and today we will be talking about spinal cord intramedullary tumors. The chair for the first session of today is our honored guest and senior faculty who is an icon in cerebrovascular surgery, Professor Rokuya Tanikawa. Professor Tanikawa is the Executive Vice President and Director of the Department of Neurosurgery, Stroke Center, Sapporo Shinkai Hospital, Japan. He is a very important member of the Japanese Neurosurgery Association and is a noted scholar with several publications in various peer-reviewed journals. He is one of the most sought-after person for the demonstration bypass in workshops conducted all around the world and hence also rightly nicknamed as the Super Bypass. He is one of the most famous and fierce proponents of open surgery for cerebral aneurysms and we sincerely thank him for accepting our invitation to chair the session of Professor Bambakidis. The chair for the second session of today is a distinguished faculty from Chile, Professor Felipe Valdivia. Professor Valdivia is a consultant neurosurgeon and chairman of the Clinica Almena de Santiago, Chile. He is an expert in the management of spinal tumors and we are extremely thankful to him for accepting our invitation to chair the session of Professor Nicolai Konvalov. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President Professor Yoko Kata, I would like to welcome both the speakers and chairs to this online platform of ACNS webinars. A very warm welcome to our colleagues in China. And we are extremely thankful to Professor Shubin for broadcasting this webinar on the WeChat channel. And with that introduction, I would like to hand over this online podium to our first chair, Professor Rokuya Tanikawa. Thank you for your invitation uh, to this session. Uh, I will chair uh, Professor Nicholas Bambakidis' uh, talk about the, uh, the contemporary treatment for uh, cerebral aneurysms. Uh, I'm very looking forward to learn a lot from uh, his presentation and uh, everybody know that uh, uh, we have uh, several options to treat the uh, uh, intracranial aneurysms. Uh, nowadays, um, according to the, according to the, uh, the development of the endovascular uh, surgery and uh, the especially uh, broad diverters, the, the surgical treatment for such a, such a aneurysms are, are disappearing, but uh, uh, I believe that uh, the, the legacy, legacy uh, neurosurgery, like uh, which we are doing, uh, still necessary. So uh, uh, I'm very looking forward to, to see the Professor the Bambakidis operation today. Uh, please, uh, Professor Bambakidis, please start your lecture. Okay. Um, thank you, Dr. Tanikwa. Thank you to everybody for in the Asian uh, Congress of Neurological Surgeons in inviting me today. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about, as, as Dr. Tanikwa mentioned, contemporary giant aneurysm management, as he mentioned, 
it's changed substantially uh, during my career even. And when I was a fellow uh, with Dr. Spetzler at the Barrow Neurologic Institute uh, back in the early 2000s, uh, just in the last 10, uh, five to 10 years with the advent of flow diverting endovascular uh, technology, but there's still lessons that we're learning uh, with respect to when those the limits of that endovascular technology in, is reached and when open surgical treatment is still uh, preferable and there's still substantial number of cases where that's remains uh, true. Uh, and I, I perform both endovascular and open uh, surgery and I'll show you uh, many of our cases here at university hospitals in Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine here in Cleveland, Ohio, where that's, where that's true. So I'm gonna limit my talk in the next uh, 30 minutes or so to giant aneurysms. Again, those are aneurysms that are more than 25 uh, millimeters. There, there's a small number of total aneurysms, two to 5%. Um, most patients, <clears throat> present with symptoms associated with mass effect or stroke symptoms due to thromboembolic events. So they don't typically present with subarachnoid hemorrhage, although 20 to 30% do, but it's not, uh, not the same as with obviously most saccular aneurysms, which are smaller in size. Now the natural history of these is poor, and we know that from even Drake's initial studies, where conservative treatment of these is associated with significant uh, morbidity, up to 80% at five years. So you, you can't really leave these alone, except in select cases, and I'll talk about that. Uh, more recent data, in the issue of data, the five-year rupture rate, you can see very, very high, 40 to 50 uh, percent of these rupturing. And then, of course, I also talked about uh, the thrombobolic complications. So when we see these and they're symptomatic, almost universally, we recommend uh, treatment with a few exception, exceptions. Now, obviously, you have to manage these at a high volume supervascular center, not at a community hospital. At UH, we have uh, 18 hospitals in our, in our system but we only treat these at Cleveland Medical Center, our flagship uh, quaternary uh, hospital where we have all of the, the treatment options available. And as I mentioned, conservative treatment is a reasonable option in patients who are older or who have severe uh, medical uh, problems. Most patients should undergo uh, treatment either uh, microsurgical or endovascular. Many require some component of flow redirection or bypass. Uh, the morbidity and mor mortality is still not insignificant, even with expert surgical treatments, 14 to 22 percent. Uh, endovascular options, and again, I'll show some examples, include flow diversion, uh, coiling, either primary or with stent assistance or parent vessel sac sacrifice. However, there's still a high rate of recanalization if you only use coils. So typically, if unless there's an acute hemorrhage rupture, we'll use stent assistance or flow diversion. But still, the morbidity and mortalities is not insignificant. And we've seen complications even with the newest endovascular techniques. And again, I'll, I'll show you some examples of those as well. So when we look at patients over the last five years, and these are both inpatient at, out, and outpatient seen at university hospitals. This was data put together by um, Marta Van Kulen, who is uh, my um, school-based research uh, fellow, and uh, Mo Patel, who's one of our endovascular fellows and residents. We've seen almost 1,500 aneurysms in total. You can see 
uh, the, the ruptured percentage in the bottom right, 16% versus, I'm sorry, top right versus unruptured, 84%. And then by location, most are ACOMs followed closely by poster communicating artery aneurysm, similar to what I'm sure everyone sees at their centers. But uh, we did not have a huge number of giant aneurysms, only uh, 13 of them. So um, overall, a smaller number than what's reported in the, in the literature. So they're not that common, at least in our geographic location here in, in the Midwest, in the USA. Nevertheless, uh, of these 13, you can see here um, the breakdown. I think there's enough data here to learn at least a few points about the management of these uh, in the modern era. Uh, three were ruptured. Most were not ruptured. Again, that's what is typically seen. And most presented with symptoms, again, of mass effect with cranial neuropathies uh, or ischemic symptoms, some with headaches. A few were incidental, and you can see in the bottom left, the location, internal carotid artery, almost 70% in the ruptured cases, and the unruptured ones, a mix in the middle cerebral artery and the ICA uh, as well. So most of the rupture are these giant proximal ICA aneurysms, whereas you see these fusiform giant middle cerebral artery aneurysms in unruptured cases, but presenting with mass effect. Uh, an equal mix of male uh, and female, uh, uh, most, I'm sorry, mostly female uh, versus male. Uh, the average age in the early 60s. In terms of treatment, you can see uh, at the bottom, 15 underwent, 15% mic underwent microsurgery, uh, on over half endovascular. Some were observed, and most of those were elderly patients with severe medical issues. <laughs> Um, and that contrasts with the overall aneurysm group, so non-giant aneurysms at the bottom, where uh, we treat about uh, equal numbers endovascularly, 16% versus 13% microsurgery. Most, obviously, are unruptured small aneurysms that we follow, but um, that we see in clinic, but of the ones treated, it's about 50-50, which is very different than the giant aneurysms. We're still, again, now in the endovascular are treating most of them endovascularly. But again, I'll show you some, uh, some issues with that and some considerations. <clears throat> the ruptured cases, um, two underwent coiling, one patient died. The unruptured cases, uh, three were observed, four were uh, Five were treated endovascularly and two were treated with, with surgical bypass and actually did very well. So I'll, here I'll just, uh, for the rest of my time, show you some case examples and again, some lessons that we've learned in managing these lesions. This is a typical ruptured giant aneurysm. Young woman, 49 years old, uh, and has four modified fissure, four right, ICA aneurysm, 30 millimeters. In the acute period, we tend not to use stents, um, stent assistance, just because of the risk of anticoagulation and antiplatelet agents. So primary coiling with a known, you can see neck remnant in the bottom right. She, she did actually very well, but um, had significant recurrence of her aneurysm, which again, you see very common with primary coil, uh, coiling of these. So she underwent pipeline and assisted coil em embolization. The bottom right, you can see, did very well, six month follow-up, no residual aneurysm seen. So this is how most of these now are treated and the results are very good. Uh, but here's a case, a 61 year old woman who presented with a, a cranial neuropathy. So a six nerve palsy giant clinoidal aneurysm. She passed a balloon test occlusion uh, test. And because of her cranial neuropathy, I thought that uh, surgical treatment of this was best performed with trapping and bypass. You can see here the procedure, uh, very straightforward craniotomy 
on the right with a, a separate incision in the cervical region of the neck. And here's just routine a dissection of the superficial temporal artery. We're just going to do a, a uh, low flow, so-called low flow bypass with an STA graft. And then a neck separate incision here, exposing the carotid artery. While the craniotomy is being performed, a routine terional craniotomy. One might argue why even do a bypass if the patient passed the test occlusion. I think that's still controversial. Um, and we've all seen patients who've had delayed stroke even with a past uh, balloon test occlusion. So I like to at least do uh, a low flow bypass and augment the blood flow in that hemisphere uh, protectively. And I think that works very well. And you can see here again, routine uh, endocyte anastomosis, uh, STA, MCA with uh, Tenno sutures to, to protect that right hemisphere uncomplicated. Uh, I usually use running sutures uh, for this. I, I'm sorry, inter interrupted sutures. I've changed from using running sutures uh, in the past. And then what, once that's completed, and you're satisfied that you have good uh, flow, and I use ICG for all of these uh, cases, then you can simply tie off the right internal carotid artery. You can see uh, here, again, in the neck. And then you can clip the uh, carotid artery distal to the aneurysm. Uh, you can see here the carotid artery, the aneurysm is uh, blowing out the cavernous sinus. You can see the posterior communicating artery is distal to the clip. And then this with trapping lets you completely decompress the aneurysm. And I think this is better for the patients who present with uh, mass effect and cranial neuropathies uh, in aiding in the resolution of, of, their, of their symptoms. And a one-year follow-up, she did very well. No cranial nerve deficit is neurologically intact. Now, what about this case? This is a 55-year-old woman. She also had a cranial neuropathy. She had a giant aneurysm, you can see here, almost uh, 40 millimeters. She failed her balloon test occlusion. She had no anterior communicating artery. And, you know, I think your options here or to do a, a large high flow bypass with a radial artery or saphenous vein graft, or which is more risky and more difficult, or perform uh, uh, endovascular treatment with coil embolization. Uh, we ended up doing coil embolization with a pipeline. Again, sort of modern way of thinking about these, but she continued to have left six nerve palsy and she'll have a follow-up angiogram. Um, she probably think she's already had it. I just don't have the images, but it looks pretty good, but still has her cranial neuropathy. So you could argue maybe this would have been better treated as I showed you the previous case. What about these ICA terminus type aneurysms, middle cerebral artery? Traditionally, we treated these with bypass and trapping. Uh, here's a a 16 year old with this large, very giant MCA aneurysm, partially um, calcified, presented with ischemic symptoms. You can see very nicely treated here, opening the sylvian fissure, treating this aneurysm. In this case, using a, a radial artery graft, you can see the distal bifurcation. You can see bringing in the radial artery graft. The, the problem with radial artery grafts, of course, is that <clears throat> they can go into spasm. And uh, you have to manage that during surgery with antispasmodic agents um, and make sure you have enough length to go from uh, the cervical carotid into the sylvian fissure or do something alternatively, such as an internal maxillary artery. 
uh, anastomosis. You can see here the distal anastomosis here with ADO sutures in good flow. And so this is a typical uh, radial artery bypass. Again, um, once this is done, tunneling it in, uh, in front of the ear to the cervical carotid. You can see we barely have enough length, even though it looked like we had plenty to start with uh, because of the tendency of the radial artery graft to shorten. And we struggled a little bit with that to tie it into a branch of the external carotid artery after putting a, a small hole in, in it with an arterial punch. The other problem with these is that in older patients, you can have significant plaque. This is a 16-year-old so the anastomosis is fairly straightforward, uh, but in older patients, you can have significant atheroma and plaque in the external carotid artery, which can make the bypass more difficult. Uh, but nevertheless, excellent flow once we uh, open everything up. And now we've replaced the entire uh, uh, MCA circulation with the bypass. And at this point, you can either do proximal or distal uh, clipping. That uh, really doesn't matter. In an unruptured case, you occlude flow. And that works very well in, uh, in closing down the anteriors. And you can see here, we put just a distal clip uh, right where the MCA comes out of the anteriors of and that will take care of it. So this is a very nice, elegant way of treating these, um, but you know, it, it's not an easy operation. Uh, it's technically demanding. You can see that the arteriogram looks fantastic with occlusion of the aneurysm. Um, but in the modern era, I would probably shied away from doing that as much and tried some of these endovascular options. You can see here an ICA terminus, another more recent case, this older patient, Hypertension within five days of a headache. Her CT it was negative for subarachnoid hemorrhage, but severe headache nevertheless. She had no anterior communicating artery either. And so again, the options are some kind of uh, double barrel bypass or high flow bypass. In this case, we tried endovascular treatment and we, I, we were unable to get a pipeline into the ACA, which was the original plan to at least try and stent coil that, uh, and then perhaps do a radial artery graft to the MCA. And we had to treat it with uh, coils, the primary coiling, and she had a post-operative infarct with significant uh, weakness. And that's one of the risks of doing endovascular treatment in the middle cerebral artery territory, are these small thalamal perforating uh, vessels that can give you a uh, significant deficit. Is a 46-year-old woman with uh, no history, but pressure behind the right eye, another large giant aneurysm MCA. And we thought went underwent very nice uh, treatment. You can see here would have alternatively needed a radial artery uh, or saphenous vein bypass, went, underwent telescoping stents, you can see very smooth uh, treatment, jailing the catheter, and then placing a first one pipeline stent, and then approximately deploying a second stent, and then coiling the aneurysm, protecting the pipelines. And we we thought this was great. Went went very well with that fantastic angiographic result. You can see here protection of the circulation, but then presented two days later with hemiparesis. And so again, you can see um, complications related to endovascular treatment, um, even though the result was pretty good endovascularly and angiographically, uh, complication we we'd have not seen as commonly with open bypass surgery. So here's an example that I, reverting sort of back to our first principles in the MCA distribution. This is a little bit more complex as well. This is a 
a 64 year old woman presented with right sided headache. Uh, she had this giant partially thrombosed MCA aneurysm. You can see here, you're only seeing a small portion of the aneurysm filling. You can see in the MRI on the right, most of the aneurysm is thrombosed. And this had been growing significantly in size over the last six months. So what do you do here? Well, we didn't want to go back to what we I just shown you with telescoping endovascular stents. I was worried again about uh, perforating branches to the internal capsule. And so here I thought, let's try and go back to our original principles of bypass surgery. And so this is what we ended up doing. Uh, in this case, we did again, but to do it, it's difficult. You have to harvest a radial artery graft because you're replacing that middle cerebral artery circulation. You can see here on this little cartoon on the right, what we were dealing with, she had her MCA bifurcation, but one M2 branch immediately uh, bifurcated again. So you have uh, really three branches that you're trying to uh, deal with. Uh, you could see in the video the exposure of the radial artery. <clears throat> Usually for this, I use the uh, cardiac team. They do a very nice job of getting the uh, radial artery exposed. You can see this giant thrombosed aneurysm that we're dealing with and trying to dissect beneath it. You can see these M4 branches that we're dissecting free. And I knew we were not going to be able with the bypass to see be able to occlude all of these uh, uh, branches with a single bypass. I, I thought it was safer than doing some secondary and side to side anastomosis or something more fancy. I thought this would work pretty well, just doing a, a radial artery to the one of the M3 branches and then redirecting flow uh, through the aneurysm, only through one and one of the M2 branches, and that I thought would be enough to shut the aneurysm down, or at least keep it from growing in this lady in her mid 60s. So that's what we did. You can see again, ADO sutures, uh, end to side anastomosis. There's significant rundown just because of the dissection involved around, around this giant aneurysm. Patent graft, uh, distally here you can see the external carotid artery being prepared using a little ink pen to mark the graft. And then um, this is what I was uh, talking about uh, in the earlier case example, where you can have, you can see I'm fighting some of this atheroma in this mid lady in her mid sixties uh, in, in a distal external carotid artery uh, branch can make the anastomosis tricky. Um, you can, uh, I'll show you when I take the, uh, temporary clamp off the carotid. There was significant uh, bleeding and I had to re replace a couple of the sutures because again, uh, it's easy to not get good suture placement because of that plaque that's in the carotid in these older patients. You can see here, just having to replace a few of those stitches. Um, you think this should be straightforward, but um, you can still have some trouble and you just have to keep working at it until you get it um, patent. You can see here, it looks good. And then removing the temporary clip in the head, checking with the Doppler, checking in the neck, and now dissecting down under the aneurysm. You can see here this giant M2 branch. And you can see in the cartoon where I'm putting the clip here. So that's creating the replaced flow taking all the temporary clips off. So most of the MCA circulation is being filled by the bypass and a small portion is filled through the aneurysm, but that's enough to completely occlude it. You can see in the post-operative angiogram, the aneurysm is essentially gone and the graft is filling most of that MCA circulation. So in this case, complicated surgical solution worked very well and she did great. She had no no complications, and at 18 months last follow-up, her angiogram looks terrific. So I'll end in the next 10 minutes or so by showing you some examples of 
posterior circulation uh, aneurysms. For the basilar tip, um, endovascular treatment is still uh, is is the mainstay. You can see here typical giant aneurysm undergoing Y stent assisted Y stent assisted coil embolization with a great endovascular result. I think this works very well. Primary coiling again leads to high rates of recanalization. Even in this case, this patient had a recurrence even with a Y stent. We had to go back in through the stent and recoil this and it uh, is stable now, but she may even need further retreatment. Uh, but the uh, risks of open surgery for these remain significant. So that's how we treat most of these. Uh, now, the vertebral basilar aneurysms remain complicated, and really, there are not great uh, durable treatments for these. Um, and I'll just show you a couple examples of what we've struggled with. You can see this a 19 year old man with. This is partially thrombosed, giant vertebral basilar aneurysm found workup for headache, severe. And I tried to treat this with a um, staged approach, stent assisted coiling, electively, but recurred after six months. You can see the stent going across from the vertebral to the basilar. But the bottom left, you can see significant uh, recurrence. Uh, continue to enlarge despite progressive uh, retreatment. So I thought, well, let's let's go in and and occlude one vertebral artery. So I actually did that open through a far lateral approach and just clip the vertebral artery on the left side, distal to the pica, so the pica is still filled, and redirected flow. So there's only one vertebral here, and that seemed to stabilize things, but it's very um, difficult to predict what these uh, are going to do um, with respect to flow diversion. But this, this seems to have the stalled growth of this particular lesion. Here's another one, 23-year-old man, progressive hearing loss. This is it getting larger. Uh, face numbness, weakness, tinnitus, dizziness, complicated lesion fed mostly by the right vertebral. And I thought, Mel, maybe directing, redirecting flow would help here as it did in the previous case. I actually did a left far lateral cranium. I think craniotomies are more precise when you want to occlude an artery you can occlude it very precisely with a single clip, just distal to the pica, maintain flow in that pica, and then just with that single clip, uh, redirect flow just to cut flow down and see if we can arrest growth of this, this aneurysm. You can see a post-op angiogram showed reduced filling of the aneurysm. I thought this looked pretty good. And I was going to bring him back and coil it, but I didn't even get to that before he fully healed, he ruptured, probably because we redirected the flow of the jet uh, somehow, again, very um, unpredictable with these lesions. And thankfully, he had a, a decompressive craniectomy already from, the, from, what, from a surgical procedure, and he actually did okay. And we shunted him and then treated this with the coiling, left a base remnant, and we'll see how this goes. He may need further uh, treatment for this. Very difficult lesions to deal with. But you can have successes. This is a more recent case. A 28-year-old woman presented with diffuse subarachnoid hemorrhage and interventricular hemorrhage. Uh, angiogram showed this partially thrombosed again, mid basilar aneurysm with this really ugly sidewall daughter sac, but then a really fusiform dilatation of the, of the basilar artery uh, with incorporation partially of the AICA uh, branches. So what do you do with this? Really no good open surgical options for these. Um, back in the old days, you might try some kind of circulatory arrest or 
a large transpetrosal approach or something. But in the modern era, we would coil off where we thought the aneurysm had ruptured in this daughter sac you can see here. And then once that's done, load the patient with uh, antiplatelet agents and uh, place a pipeline uh, through the basilar artery. And you can see here, post bleed day seven, significant stasis already in the rest of the aneurysm after you place a pipeline stent, put a shunt in, and this looks pretty good. Now, of course, this is an acute um, result. We'll have to see in case it's only a, couple, a month or two old. And um, we'll follow this patient closely. Would not surprise me if she required uh, retreatment at some point in the future. So um, I'll, I'll stop there just with a couple of conclusions. I, clearly, giant aneurysms require a collaborative approach, both microsurgical and endovascular options, uh, which I discussed here today. But both pipeline flow diversion with coil embolization and bypass with parent clip uh, ligation, uh, bo both remain excellent treatments for giant ICA aneurysms. And I would argue that with patients with cranial neuropathies, uh, where there's mass effect, you should still consider open clipping, trapping, and um, assessment with test occlusion plus minus bypass is the best treatment option um, for those patients. In the MCA region, you know, I think it's still it's still difficult. We most places, uh, at least in the United States, have gone to using flow diversion. Um, but we've seen, and I showed you several examples of perforator infarcts uh, with that treatment. And we frankly haven't seen that in most of our open surgical uh, bypass trap cases. So I, I've kind of gone back a little bit in my thinking for those. And I think um, generally speaking, you, you should consider that either with a radial artery or uh, some other high flow mechanism as a, a better treatment potentially, even though it's again a more difficult uh, procedure. Uh, in the posterior circulation, giant vertebra basilar uh, circulation aneurysms, I think those are even um, more difficult clinical entity to treat uh, successfully. We don't have great uh, endovascular treatment options for those. We have seen some success with flow diversion and with senescistic coiling, but um, um, we really don't have good open surgical options. So um, we, we fall back on the endovascular options we have available for us as a primary treatment modality, but they remain extremely, extremely challenging. So I'll, I'll stop there uh, and, um, and I open it up for further a uh, discussion uh, for the treatment of these very difficult uh, vascular lesions. Again, thank you. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me to speak to you today and um, look forward to the discussion. Okay. Thank you, Ben, ben uh, he He showed us uh, the excellent surgical treatment uh, combine, uh, combined approach, uh, not only a trapping, uh, using, uh, using a bypass revascularization and uh, collaborating with the uh, endovascular treatment, especially stent uh, uh, assist coiling and uh, flow, di flow diverters. Uh, though the, 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 the one of the very big option to treat such a uh, uh, complex aneurysms. Uh, I have uh, several questions. Uh, the, in the first case, you showed us that the, you trap the, the, the cavernous segment carotid aneurysm. Uh, in that case, uh, 
the ophthalmic artery is included in a trapping. Uh, I have a concern of the, uh, the regrowth of the aneurysm after surgery because of uh, the blood feeding through the ophthalmic artery to the aneurysm. Uh, in that case, the, the patient was very good, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. I, you know, I, we have seen, as you mentioned, in the post-operative angiogram films, film, sometimes you can see filling retrograde through the ophthalmic into even the aneurysm. Uh, in the few patients that I've followed, I've not seen regrowth. Um, and it seems to be fairly durable. But I, have you seen that in, in your experience? And how, how would you deal with that? I, I mean, we don't have a good way of uh, 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 managing that short of occluding the ophthalmic artery, of course, surgically at the time of the clipping. Yeah. Um, it, actually, uh, when I treat such a patient, uh, I do an anticrinoidectomy and open the distal dura ring. And uh, I, uh, I, I make the, uh, the distal clipping proximal uh, to the uh, ophthalmic, uh, proximal to uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, carotid proximal to the ophthalmic artery. And uh, the, I mean that the, the bypass, bypass retrograde flow or uh, collateral flow, uh, back flow should be uh, flow, flow out into uh, ophthalmic artery. I, I do I do like this in this way, but uh, yeah, in many cases I know the the even even if the ophthalmic artery is included in a trapping, the almost aneurysm is is thrombosed completely. Yeah. But very rarely uh, such a such a the, uh, bad cause may happen, and that's the reason why I ask you. Yeah, I think that's a very good point, uh, and certainly a consideration. Uh, the other, the other thing you worry about, obviously, is blindness. You usually you don't see that um, with clipping the ophthalmic, but it, it can happen. Um, so I, I worry about that too. But I, you know, that's the point of the talk. That these are <laughs> these are really difficult lesions, and they can be very unpredictable. And you know, even my talk is not very scientific, right? I mean, it's, it's our experience. And even in our experience, we kind of have gone a little bit back and forth, depending on what we've seen with our more most recent complications, because the data is, is not, is not great, uh, especially for these uh, MCA aneurysms, uh, um, you know, in terms of endovascular treatment. Um, so I think an important thing that can remember is that the easiest way to treatment to treat these is not always the best either and in your opening remarks you discussed um, the open surgery and how it can remains a, an important treatment method and I think that's a that's something for the younger generation neurosurgeons to keep in mind as well we've seen that yeah and uh, uh, another one point it's um, in your uh, in your case of uh, the middle cerebral artery giant aneurysms, the after the stenting flow diver flow diverter or stenting, the the patient have the uh, the infection in uh, ventricular steroid artery territory. Uh, the the many of endovascular surgeons. Uh, emphasize that uh, even uh, the flow diverters uh, can preserve the uh, perforators uh, or anterior corridor arteries flow, but uh, the <laughs> still now I can't believe it. The some may be preserved, but uh, some may have occluded. Uh, how do you think about it? Yeah, I think that's a great point, and uh, it depends on who you talk to. But um, <laughs> we've, seen, we've seen strokes. We've seen strokes. I, I think if you're very careful, um, you know, some patients don't respond to to 
Plavix or the other antiplatelet agents, and you have to be very careful in testing patients. Uh, and um, but it's unpredictable. I think um, usually if it's a large vessel, um, it won't occlude because there'll be uh, demand through the stent and it'll stay open. But the real risk for me is when you think of these small perforating uh, vessels, similar to what we've seen in the basilar artery. I showed you a case, a ruptured case at the end. We put a flow diverting stent in the basilar artery. We had no choice. I mean, it was the best. What else were we going to do as a ruptured case? We needed to treat it. This was the best way we thought. And we did not have a stroke, but we've seen that. And it's, it's unpredictable. And in the MCA, we've had several cases now in a row where we've, we've had that complication. So that's why I kind of gone back to you know, the way when I saw Dr. Spetzler treat these back early when I was a fellow, you put a clip on distally uh, in the aneurysm, it occludes. If there's flow demand into the small perforators, you may not even see it on the angiogram. It'll, you'll get enough flow to keep those open. And the patients, we did not, we've not seen uh, strokes uh, with that method of treatment. At least I haven't, again, smaller experience, even though just from the number of cases, even though I've been doing this for 15 years, but um, it, it just, it still seems to work um, a little bit more reliably, but very unpredictable and, um, but a very good point. Yes, Professor Pembakidis, thank you for, uh, for your uh, very uh, nice presentation, both in, uh, so you are also a, a hybrid neurosurgeon, both doing the open surgery and the interventional treatment. Actually, uh, just uh, the topic about the M1 segment giant aneurysms. Uh, I also do the bypass combined with the distal clip of the uh, big uh, MC aneurysm. But just as you mentioned, it's uh, unpredictable because uh, we still have uh, some uh, infarction in the lenticular arteries territory. Because you know the uh, if you clip the distal part of the uh, giant aneurysm dome, actually the blood flow in the in the aneurysm was uh, dramatically slowed down. And if it's uh, slowed down to a threshold, I think it still have some uh, propensity to form the thrombos. So we, uh, I have. Uh, two cases uh, around uh, totally in, uh, I, uh, I think there's around, in two cases of the 13 total cases, just uh, for this kind of uh, patient still have some uh, delayed uh, thrombos in the lenticular artery. Yeah, so yeah. No. It's not, so uh, this segment is the most difficult to treat. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I agree. I agree. Do you do them on? Do you do, you do the surgical cases on aspirin or antiplatelet agents, or do you do them? With yes, health? yes, yes. Yeah. But uh, normally it's uh, <laughs> uh, ineffective. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. Yeah, I agree. And I also agree with you that uh, sometimes even the patient pass the balloon occlusion test, they still have some. Uh, potential risk for the delayed ischemic condition. So uh, I, uh, for this kind of patient, I will do the enhanced prone occlusion test, which means we will decrease the blood pressure around 30%. If the patient still can go in through very well, you can occlude the IC very safely. If the patient has some, some ischemic condition, you will do that differently. We need the STMCA bypass. Yeah, yeah. I think I think that's a good point. There are people who would argue that that, that is very uh, predictive of, of a good result. Um, makes me nervous, but we've done that. <laughs> too. We've done that too. I mean, if you make people hypotensive enough, they'll get symptomatic, right? So yeah. it's, it's radiation. Um, but, but yeah, that's a very good point. And if you can avoid um, two incisions and just occlude the carotid 
endovascularly, that's not unreasonable. Um, to yeah, one of my colleagues asked you that uh, he saw in your video, you used uh, some instruments to cut the vessel wall very neatly. What's that? Uh, you, you mean to make the hole in the artery? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, they're arterial punches. Okay. The vascular surgeons use them uh, all the time. Okay. Um, if you, you can use the very, the smallest ones that, that they make will, will work for a radial artery graft. Um, I forget the sizing, they're only a two millimeters, I think, okay. one or two millimeters. But they make a very nice, sharp opening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like very, rock. very good. Yeah. Yeah, that device can uh, can uh, that device can avoid the uh, the mechanical dissection of the apparent artery. Yes. Oh, so you the, also use it. I, use it. Yeah. Okay. I, yeah, I always use it mm -hmm. when I I make the hole on the external carotid or high flow bypass. Okay. Now, one one more important point. Uh, when uh, when we uh, we trap the the M1 segment aneurysm, uh, I always try to preserve the uh, anterograde flow through the uh, uh, M1 to M2. Uh, for example, if the, uh, the giant aneurysm at the uh, uh, MCA bifurcation and uh, you perform the, uh, the STMC double bar bypass something and uh, trap the aneurysm, the one of M2 should be the anastomose directly uh, with M1. Then you can uh, maintain the anterograde flow through the M1 to M2. The, with this procedure, the, we can prevent the delayed thrombosis of the lenticular straight arteries uh, at the M1, distal M1 segment. The, this is a one of solution for uh, MC giant annuals. And I showed that in my last case um, a little bit differently than what you mentioned, but um, but yeah, I think maintaining some some flow through there it is protective for those. Yes. For those yes. Yeah. Yeah. So keep yeah. uh, actually it's uh, keep the velocity of the blood flow. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. We have Ben from Hong Kong who has raised his hand. Yes, Ben. Yeah, uh, ha yes. Uh, hello, uh, uh, Professor Chris. Uh, thank you for your excellent presentation and also a quick sharing of uh, uh, these difficult vascular cases from the panel. My question is uh, uh, for those, uh, I've another case, encounter cases of a, a giant uh, bacilla dolacoritasia with mass effect on the brain span. So uh, in this situation, both endovascular and open treatment are very difficult. Can you share some uh, tips uh, or your strategy on management of this uh, few um, uncommon situation? Thank you. First number, please. Yeah, I we don't. I I showed you some of those examples at the end. There's for the truly dolichoctatic lesions. I mean, there's, there's really, it depends on what, what the symptoms are, but um, it, if it's a flow problem, we might try and do some kind of um, stent assisted coiling. If it's a mass effect problem, I know people in the past have, have, have put slings or gone open surgically to try and uh, put uh, sponges or something to try and get get the portions of the aneurysm away from the cranial nerves. I, I've never thought that worked particularly well. There's no, I wish I had a better answer. I mean, we, we try and treat them. I showed you different methods. It's very, it's highly unpredictable. Sometimes things work very well. Some, sometimes they're disastrous. I, I don't have a, I don't have a great treatment paradigm to share with you. Hopefully we'll develop better tools to treat these in the future. Uh, but I don't, I don't know if any of the other experts have any <laughs> other pearls of wisdom with respect to those very difficult lesions. Yes, one comment. Yes, Professor. A great lecture, great lecture by Nicholas and equally great comments from 
Professor Tanika and Professor Bin. My just one comment is, you know, I just add one more point to what Professor Bin told. If we do cross-circulation studies, he told correctly that he will also do the hypotension. But one more thing, it's simultaneous appearance of veins on either side. If that is there, then shows their cross-circulation is really good. If, if veins appear delayed on the other side, then there's a problem, even if there is good cross-circulation. This is what we have seen at our place. And then I, I really like the talk of Nicholas. He told about uh, three giant sets of giant aneurysms, one from the carotid circulation, another from MCA, another from posterior circulation. And he summarized saying that giant aneurysms in ICA, if they present with cranial nerve deficit, he said he will rather go for uh, bypass uh, rather than coil embolization. But his two cases uh, both presented with fixed nerve palsy. I think what he told is the one which presented, uh, which he did coil embolization, six nerve palsy didn't improve, which proves the point which he has told. And also he told MCA, always and he will rely on bypass trapping and for posterior circulation he told that it is still we are with endovascular is a bigger option than surgery great lecture enjoyed the comments of professor tani Kama also how we will trap a aneurysm proximal to carotid to prevent refilling of the aneurysm congratulations to all three of you thank you thank you professor thank you for this wonderful uh, comments. I would like to ask Professor Bambakidis uh, two questions. The first is, what is your anticoagulation policy when you embark on a bypass and an, on an elective basis as well as emergency procedure? Well, usually uh, if it's a ruptured aneurysm, I'll, we'll just, it doesn't come up that often for a bypass. Um, we'll just do the bypass and I won't, I won't give anything um, in terms of antiplatelet agents, uh, but it's not, again, it's not that common. In, in all other cases, I'll start the patient on uh, aspirin, 325 milligrams, uh, at least three days before the, the procedure. Um, and it, it does make the surgery a little more difficult, um, but it, it, it definitely improves graft patency. So I've tried to just use baby aspirin in the, in the, past 81 milligrams, it doesn't work as well. Um, so th that's usually what I do. I'd be interested, I know, um, uh, uh, to hear what the other experts do in their cases, but that's, that's what I do. I, I haven't had to use Plavix or any other antiplatelet agents. Aspirin works, works very well. Thank you. One more question. I would like to hear your comments and your thoughts about acute occlusion of ICA after the bypass versus graded occlusion by a Silverstone clamp. I know Professor Shubin has modified the Silverstone clamp and he tightens a one millimeter each he showed us before. What are your thoughts on this? I've never done that. I, I we just, we've tied it off with the bypass. It seems to work. Well, I think if you're not going to do a bypass and you want to have progressive occlusion. I mean, that was the old way of treating these. Um, then I think that that makes more intuitive sense. Uh, but since I tend to, to go ahead and do a bypass in any case, um, that then I think it's probably not necessary. But I don't know. I'd like to hear if, uh, what the other experts think. Professor well, Shubin, would you like to comment? Uh, yes. Actually, I use it normally for the uh, for the uh, STA MCA double bypass combined with uh, uh, ICA occlusion because you know especially in female patient uh, the STA was not so sick and the blood flow to the uh, immediately immediately after even double bypass it's not enough to replace the MCA. Uh, network uh, MCA territory. So if you use a progressive clip, uh, you may give the patient time and the uh, actually the bypass uh, of STA can be enlarged and the uh, blood volume can increased. 
Thank you. Thank you very much for that tip. And with that, we come to the conclusion of the first lecture. And I would like to invite Professor Tanika for his final remarks. Okay, yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Bambakidis. Uh, we have um, <laughs> much more discussions, but uh, the time, time limited. Uh, we should close this session. Uh, see you soon. Uh, see you soon again. Yes. Uh, in, uh, in some meeting, in real meeting. Hopefully in person. <laughs> I, I invite everybody to San Francisco in October if you can come. It's in person, like the CNS mm -hmm. meeting. Hopefully we'll have some folks come visit us. We have a great program. So I'd invite you all to try and make it. Thank you. Okay, but uh, you. You, you know, in October, we also have a ACNS Congress, yeah, in, in Shanghai. So actually, it, we have a very strict uh, anti-pandemic strict uh, policy. So it's an online meeting, yeah. Well, I'm disappointed, <laughs> but that's okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Well, thank you very much. We had a wonderful lecture and I would like to thank both the speaker and the chair, Professor Bambakadis and Professor Rukwe Tanikawa for their time and support for us. So we'll move on to the second session. We have Professor Konvalov with us. Welcome, Professor. Thank you very much. And I would like to invite the second chair, Professor Philippe Valdivia, to say a short introduction and invite Professor Konvalov for his lecture, Professor Valdivia. Okay, thanks. Thanks for the organizer to invite me at this web seminar of the ASEAN Congress of Neurosurgical Con uh, I hope we have the time in the next month, maybe next year, to, to we'll have a presential congress. And I think every, everybody thinks it's the best condition. Today, we're talking of intramedullary tumor, a very special pathology and a great challenge because are not frequently, but you have the possibility to have a very good result in the curve of survival. But you need to work in a team with a very good neurosurgical techniques and also with a biomechanical concept to have a good quality of life in this patient. The goal is a gross total resection in almost case with no damage. It's not very easy to, 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 to do and no instability for the future. Today we have the possibility to learn of a leader in intramedular tumor topics. I knew his work many years ago in the world's neurosurgical meeting at Istanbul. It's very interesting. Professor Nicholas Konolov finished his medical study at Mos Moscow Medical Academy in 1994 after finished his neurosurgical resident and spine fellowship at Budenko, Bud I'm sorry, Budenko Neurosurgical Center. He did extensive postdoctoral training in Western Europe and United States. He's co corresponding member of the Russian Academy of Science, member of the Russian so Association of Neurosurgeons has activity participation at the European Association of Neurosurgeons. Since uh, 2019, he told the, he hold the office of uh, EANS board member responsible for continual medical education guidelines. Currently, he's a, spin, a spinal neurosurgeon leader at Buderko Neurosurgical Spine Center in Moscow, Russia. Remember, please send your question to we'll have a nice discussion after this presentation. Please, Dr. Konola. Okay, hi. Good afternoon to everybody. And uh, just thank you for giving me a chance to participate in such interesting conference. Okay, so just today we're going to talk about surgical strategy for intermediate spinal cord tumors. But the idea is to talk about the, not only about the surgical treatment of intermediate cord tumors. The idea was to talk about whole strategy because it's important not only to do the surgery, it's only understood which kind of surgery you do and what you have to do after the surgery or before the surgery. Uh, so, <clears throat> As you already told, uh, as you already was told, I'm from Burdenk Neurosurgical uh, Institute Center, 
is the biggest uh, neurosurgical center in Russia. I can say only several um, uh, several things about the center. We have 300 beds only for neurosurgery, more than 20 ORs, and we're doing more than 10,000 neurosurgical cases per year. Uh, so today I'm going to share our experience in the literature and our experience of our uh, medical center about treatment, treatment of intermedial cord tumors. So as all you, all you know that intermedial cord tumors of spinal cord up to four to four, uh, from two to four percent from all the tumors of central nervous system. Today we're going to talk about most um, usual one in pedimomas, also about astrocytomas, demandioblastomas, cavernomas, and some others. If you look at the literature which is published before COVID area, the number of publications about intermediate cord tumors are growing from day to day. And um, we find out in the literature, but only about seven systematic reviews, which is very good, strong evidence-based, um, who are describing the strategy of treatment of intermediate cord tumors. And here we're presenting here two of them, and here another five. Some of them published only one or two years ago, so rather you know, fresh publications. And so if you want to learn, uh, I can say most parts about treatment of intermediate cord tumors, you can have a look at the literature of these publications. We have in, the, in our series, we have more than 10,000 patients that we, we uh, operate for intermediate cord tumors in Burdenka Neurosurgical Center. Surely it's not the experience of the one, of the one surgeon, it's the experience of groups of the surgeons. Uh, and um, so you can see uh, that we have about more than 400 epidemomas, more than 200, um, uh, 200 astrocytomas. And I'm going to describe these groups a little bit later. Uh, so um, at the very beginning, for example, very important thing is, um, uh, is uh, to understand when uh, to do the surgery for intermediate cord tumors, especially, for example, for impedimomas. And according to the literature, according to our experience, uh, you have to do the surgery at the earliest um, uh, stages of developing of the tumor. When you can see, when you see the growing of the tumor on MRI, and you can see the first symptoms which is coming. Why we have to do the surgery as fast as possible? Because if the tumor is small and it's growing, it's important that it's growing, it for sure it will develop the symptoms in, 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 the, in the past. But in the, when the tumor is small, it's very easy to resect it. If the neurological deficit after the surgery it will be nothing. And you can resect it for sure totally. And you totally can cure, uh, cure the patients. We're talking about, you know, for sure, about, about um, treating of mandioblastomas, empendemomas, cholecystic astrocytomas, um, uh, and some other tumors. So uh, for our experience and for the international experience of the literature, you have to be very, nowadays be very, very aggressive when you see the growing so the tumor with the light symptoms. and that we are, that we are uh, recommended. Other thing is from our experience is you now when you see the huge tumor of, for example, huge ependymoma, and the patients have a severe neurological deficit, and he's already near lost the possibility for walking. So uh, because if you if you do total resection of this tumor, I'm talking about the really big tumors, which is within the severe neurological deficit. It may be not to do the total resection. You can leave small part in the, um, uh, the motor tracts uh, and you just prevent this neurological deficit because nobody going to die after not totally resected of the empendymoma, for example. And But you, if you prevent the neurological deficit after the section of the tumor, the patients can stay for five or six years the same neurological status, not worse, for example, with the um, uh, possibility to walk. So this is another important statement. So to be, you have to be very aggressive um, uh, at the beginning uh, to uh, to do try to do the more smallest tumors. And another thing, you know, always remember about ne ne neurological deficit after the surgery. You don't need to have a patient in the wheelchair after the surgery, but with totally clear MRIs. So always remember about the neurological status. <clears throat> so from the new, 
investigations recent tractography you can see here example of different of um, uh, how we do tractography but in rio it doesn't play a much role at, um, at the, making the decision of the surgery about the, the plan of the surgery still we think in the future maybe when, when because now we get the days we apply also the interoperative mri and maybe in the near future it will play more roles than it do nowadays only this is another example of new investigation like focus dvi continuously core tumors so now we're going to take and talk about the first group about impendimoma uh, so uh, for impendimoma from the literature we say that the best decision is grow is total resection to gross total resection so you need to um, try to do this Surely, as I told you before, when the patient is a very poor neurological deficit, near uh, the paralyzed, sometimes maybe it's better to do only partial resection to prevent neurological deficit. Uh, in our series, we have more than four, four, 400 ependymomas, and um, mostly of the ependymomas you see in your operation room are ependymomas grade two. So most of them have a nice border of the section. You know, the section. Uh, only anaplastic impedimomas, which are very rare, have you no know, good border for the dissection. Here is example, an, another example of small impedimoma uh, with a nice tractography. But even in this, in these small tumors, when you see them, and if they have a slight neurological um, uh, deficit or some uh, you already need to do the surgery. It's very easy to resect the tumor of this size. And it's very also safe and you can totally resect it and the patient will be totally cured for his life. Uh, this is example already with it, most of the size of the tumors that we're dealing. This is the epidemoma for three segments. And you can see here that uh, we use always midline and more for the most epidemomas we use midline incision. Midline is the part where the vessels is go is where the vessels is going inside. And um, uh, so, and you can see how usually epidemoma have a very nice border of um, between the border from the spinal cord, the border of the section, and you find one pole, then you find another pole, and then you can gently, uh, gently remove all the tumor. <clears throat> uh but but sometimes sometimes there is a little bit mess no so nice borders at the poles of epidemoma and also at the um at the, at the front part when epidemoma uh, uh, near the motor trucks so this is uh, totally removing the tumor in one block usually you don't do one block resection usually you do a partial resection and uh, uh, as I told you, uh, there is sometimes uh, you cannot identify your border of resection, the section in the poles because there is glioses there. And also in the front um, part of the tumor from which the tumor is growing, there is some tissue which is, um, uh, there is no really border between it and motor tracks. Uh, sometimes it is a problem to uh, find a good uh, border of the section in this front area. Uh, so for this, we use um, metabolic navigation. It's the same principle as to use it on the, on the head. Um, you put, give five ala uh, in uh, three hours before the surgery, then the five ala concentrates in the tumors and, and in the tumors. And um, you can see uh, after this, this is the tumor in normal light. And this is the intermediate core tumor in, in a special light of microscope or endoscope. And um, uh, you can see that the, the, the active part of the tumor, as you see, is shining. Uh, surely, uh, it's very difficult sometimes for the small pieces of the tumor to understand if they're really shining or not. So we use for the more uh, better understanding if there is metabolic activity in, the, in the, this field or not. We use laser spectroscopy. So uh, it's a uh, laser spectroscopy. It's the same. You do give fire and. Uh, three hours before the surgery and then you take your laser spectroscopy and check the tumor if the tumor um, shows you that the concentration 12 15 then it is metabolic activity is the active part of the tumor and when you see some suspicious part of the tumor 
when you don't know this is a gliosis or some another tissue which is not look like the spinal cord but it's sometimes it's dangerous to resect it you check with your laser spectroscopy if the activity is low one or two then it is not a tumor and you can leave it alone why it's important i told you in the front of the tumor sometimes you see some tissue which is look different uh, from the spinal cord but is already not a tumor and there is no really good border between it and the spinal cord. But checking them with laser spectroscopy, metabolic activity, you can be sure that this part of uh, the uh, different tissue is not a tumor and you can leave it alone and you're not going to have any recurrence. So the principle is that told you resect, you resect the tumor and there are some parts which you need to check after it and if it's have a metabolic activity, you resect them. If not, you can leave it and prevent neurological deficit, not damaging the spinal cord. You know, here is an example already of a little bit bigger tumor. This is an ependymoma, which is go from the from all cervical level you know, to, <clears throat> uh, to, uh, to half of the thoracic level. So here you can see also midline incision and the very beginning you see this, this is a metabolic activity. You see the tumor is shining but not all of them, but we, now we check um, with the laser spectroscopy, um, the activity of the tumor, and it shows that the tumor uh, is, uh, is active. Now we do the partial resection with the CUSA. You see that there's in some places, the border of the tumor is, uh, is very clear, and you part by piece by piece, you, <coughs> you remove it using ultrasound aspirator and um, uh, microtechnics. Okay, and at the, at, the, at the end of this, at the end of this procedure, you can see the whole, all, the whole spinal cord is open, but there's still some parts uh, which is mm, we're not sure that this uh, looks like suspicious tumor or not, or the tumor especially here on the pole. So we check now with them. Mm, uh, uh, my, my microscope in special light and then we use a um, uh, laser spectroscopy and check all the bottom of the and poles of the of the tumor um, uh, uh, of, of the spinal cord for, try to find out in, if there are any uh, pieces which is looking not like a regular spinal cord still have metabolic activity if they have it then you just need to try to resect them if it's possible if they don't have it just leave them alone uh, so, and here is mm, uh, closing of the spinal cord, and this is a preoperative MRI, and here is a postoperative MRI with total resection of this intermediate cord tumor with nice neurological status after the surgery. So here is our algorithm that we propose how to mm, have to strategy of um, uh, the treating of ependymomas. So gross total resection is the best thing. And if you can do this, then you finish, you, you treat the patient. If you can do this, you do partial resection, then you do um, observe the patient. And if you see growing um, on MRI and already the developing of some symptoms, you can do, go to the second surgery or to send to radio surgery. It's also available. Uh, so you need to do the gross total resection. If you want to prevent neurological deficit, then do partial resection and then observe, go to another surgery or you know, do the radiotherapy. Nearly monitoring is obligatory and treating all kinds of intermediate cord tumors. And on all the tumors, and we do use DV, DVs, use any all the kind of neuro monitoring during the surgery, and um, uh, it's very, very, very useful to prevent neurological deficit um, in many cases. <clears throat> this is our results in um, Marconic scale for ependymomas, and now we uh, come uh, through the astrocytomas. Uh, so for astrocytomas, there's more, most, more, we have more than 200 astrocytomas. Most important thing is, this is previous classification, which is not nowadays. This is classification with WHO of uh, 2016. And here you can see that astrocytomas is not this, all the same. There is a platistic astrocytomas, it's here. It's tumors which is looking like ependymomas that have border and the diffuse astrocytomas. So platistic astrocytomas for the classification of um, 2016 are usually are, are, are benign. 
a grade one. Uh, so grade two will be diffuse astrocytomas and anaplastic astrocytomas are grade three and glioblastomas, which are very rare in the spinal cord, are a grade four. So this is like it looks before. Uh, so for, and um, so surely platistic astrocytomas have the border of the section, anaplastic astrocytomas doesn't have the border of the section. And here is an example of surgical treatment of platistic astrocytomas of, uh, of uh, the lower part of the spinal cord. And you can see the same, that the tumor have very nice, uh, very nice you know, borders. Um, uh, and you can easily resect it, you know, the tumor, <coughs> uh, even, even in, in one piece and unblocked, which is surely you don't need to do this. And um, uh, here is a tumor comparing to the spinal cord. <sighs> this is the size of the tumor. This will close the spinal cord. And here you can see post-operative fMRI total resection of this tumor. And the patient is the same neurological status as before the surgery. So this is where talking how, uh, how uh, logistic astrocytoma is supposed to look like. And this is an example of the different kind of tumor, glioblastoma. I told you it's very rare in spinal cord. It's more often, the more, more often the glioblastomas are in, uh, in the brains. But when you have glioblastoma in spinal cord, you are in big trouble because it's not possible to resect it all because <laughs> you can do it. <laughs> So you can do only the debulking, you can resect, do the biopsy, resect the tissue, which is looking like a tumor. And then you have to send the, do the some decompression. You can do also duroplasty, and then you have to send the patient to radiosurgery or a hemotherapist. Uh, this is another example of anaplastic astrocytoma. This is... Um, you can see that the tumor located in one part is asymmetric. It's located in one part of the spinal cord. It's usually for anaplastic astrocytomas. So you open the PM matter. You don't go hear the midline incision. You open the PM matter, and you see that the half of the spinal cord is totally destroyed by, by this kind of, of anaplastic astrocytoma. Also, you cannot resect it totally. You can do the biopsy. You can resect as much as possible. And then, and after this, you just need to uh, need to, to, to after this to stop the surgery. And also, it's better to send immediately to radio surgery or chemotherapist. Uh, this is um, example, uh, as I told you before, that the uh, uh, that the platistic astrocytoma is supposed to be benign. This is example, of, and but we uh, and uh, in all the literature. Um, uh, for last 10 years, we find out that many people died after the resection of platistic astrocytoma, which is supposed to be uh, benign. And here is an example of this. Uh, this is the tumor we got. Uh, this is a girl we got here um, with the, this size, this, this kind, uh, this uh, kind of the tumor. You see the borders were nice. And so we do you know, the resection of this tumor using metabolic navigation. And um, uh, because of the, uh, we lose, have the, the serious increasing, uh, decreasing of the, the, the narrow monitoring problems, but the narrow monitoring, we don't resect all the tumor, we resect the most part of the tumor to prevent neurological deficit after the surgery. And the bi biopsy, uh, biopsy was a platistic astrocytoma. So we were told, we were told that it was no, but platistic astrocytoma. At this time, we think it was benign tumor. This case was about seven or ten, maybe years, maybe years ago. Mm, so you can see the, the, the not not total but partial resection of this tumor. Mm, this is at the end of the surgery. You see that we resect as much as we can according to near monitoring. And here the, the girl after the surgery, he uh, he be, uh, she she become better. She can eat. 
she can eat, she can swallow because before this, the surgery have a problems with swallowing. And because we think this is a benign tumor, uh, we think it's okay. But look, uh, look what happened. Uh, uh, so her her uh, husband came to us in a, in a couple of months with this. This is MRI was three days after this, after uh, first surgery. You see that we resect more than half of the tumor and the tumor is the same size. But what happened in the, in the six weeks? You see in six weeks, this tumor is, is twice or three times bigger, bigger than, than, um, than uh, it was uh, right after the surgery. So in one month and a half, it was several times bigger. So we need to go to another surgery uh, and this, uh, there was a, there was a same uh, this period I told you it was about six, six uh, about eight years ago, and um, uh, do the same uh, the surgery again, and uh, the same diagnosis pelatistic astrocytoma. Um, very much remove uh, also as fast as possible and send you to uh, the radiotherapy and the chemotherapy because and she's in you see in the very bad neurological conditions after the surgery so and this is our experience but also in, in different publications till 1972 uh, the, uh, the, some surgeons find out that the people with the diagnosis of benign palatistic astrocytomas can die in 24 months after the first surgery and so, um, and uh, and in, and nowadays there is a new type of the tumor. It's peloid astrocytomas with the things of anaplasia, um, and an anaplasia, and this classification, which is published in uh, 2000, uh, to, 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 to 20, uh, 2016, is now changed in 20 into into 2021 because we now we're using a lot of genetic investigation like next next generation sequencing and um, uh, methylation and the uh, study of the methylation profile some new we're using some new machines like illumina and some a lot of investigations and so there is now a new type of the tumor it's high grade astrocytomas with the peloid pel morphology uh, so this is the new kind of time of the tumor, and it is already put in in new uh, classification 2021 of the WHO. So now you well, you all have to understand what happened in the in the um, developing of in science about astrocytomas, the uh, the the pelatistic astrocytomas now can be also high grade astrocytomas and this is very important so if you get the your diagnosis in your operation room that you have a pelatistic pelatistic astrocytoma you always have to, to measure key 67 if key 67 is more than 10 or you have to send them uh, you have to send or uh, about eight you have to send um, uh, the material to the some um, genetic investigation and sometimes uh, you know the, the, the people who are experienced now with this investigation can um, uh, can say that this is tumor is malignant and you immediately have to send these patients to radio surgery or hemotherapy if the if the um, t67 is more than 10. so you have to be very accurate in this group of a group of um, group of astrocytomas this is about plastic astrocytomas if you are lucky you can you can do the gross total resection but even if if you then see that the key 67 is more than 10 it's better to send to radio surgery or um, radio surgery or chemotherapy because this is malignant tumor in so so in the total in the not total resection also if you you can observe if t67 is low if it's high sent to genetic examinations and then sent to additional therapy about diffuse astrocytomas you can do only the biopsy or partial resection uh partial resection also you can do you can put um, uh, you can do duroplasty and then uh, also even in the case if, if in the case of high grade for sure chemotherapy and radiotherapy but even in the case of low grade diffuse astrocytomas now we send them 
to the radio surgery and the special protocols, how to treat um, low grade, um, low grade um, astrocytoma, diffuse astrocytomas with the help of the radio surgery. Uh, this is our results of McCormick scale. Now I'm going to talk about on demand blastomas. So for demand blastomas, we have more than 130 patients. And <coughs> there is a, a several options how to treat them. What is more very important, well, surgical is a classic one. You can use a preoperative embolization um, or you can use intraoperative angiography. But embolization in huge tumors is nice. Uh, but also for the tumors, we don't have any neurological signs or very small neurological signs. Radio surgery now plays a very, very important role. So nowadays, according to um, all, all, a lot of evidence-based articles, and again, according to our experience, if you have, for, for example, Dipilla Landau disease, and you do resection of several, or do a resection of from the, the, the demandioblastoma that caused the most neurological symptoms. You can also, for small one, for who are going to grow um, and develop the symptoms, you can send them to radio surgery. Uh, so this is important method of investigation is CT perfusion. As you can see at these films, now this MRI with no contrast is only a cyst and just it's a cyst. And if you put a contrast, you see little small shining dot in this cyst, it's already looking like mm, you're thinking about the tumor. But if you do CT perfusion, it's a red one. It means that the high flow blood, uh, how high blood flow, um, a lesion that means that this is the small demand blastoma which produced this cyst and this swallow of this on the brain or the spinal cord. Uh, this is example also of this um, uh, see small demand blastoma which is sitting inside the huge cyst, um, uh, which produce, the cyst producing all the symptoms, and you can um, uh, easily resect uh, resect this tumor. It's not a difficult surgery, and you don't need even to donate the cysts because if you do your MRI in a couple of months, you'll see that all cysts are gone. Uh, and another another kind of demandioblastomas is solid one where the cysts are small, but the the, uh, the, the symptoms called this is this is uh, CT perfusion. You can see that the tumor is like a red one, uh, and that means that the high um blood flow in the tumor that means that this is a this is a demandioblastoma it's important because sometimes you don't know with which tumor you're going to deal with the epidemoma or, de or demandioblastoma but using the ct perfusion you can easily make your differential diagnosis uh, here you can see um, uh, how we surely using you know, all you know demandioblastoma is supposed to be resected in one block not partial resection, not biopsy. Interoperative angiography is very useful. You can find, you see here, here, see the huge vessel which is feeding all this demandioblastoma and another vessel is here. Here is this huge vessel. And you have uh, to prevent bleeding from demandioblastoma. You have to go to directly to the feeding vessels and coagulate them. The trick here is that um, uh, you need to, uh, the feeding vessel sometimes is very thick. You can see here the bleeding from it. It's better to, to take the, your, your most thickest coagulator and put uh, some, um, uh, um, uh, some power of coagulation to you know, form uh, up. Uh, because if you don't do this, it sometimes it will be difficult to coagulate this thick feeding artery. Um, you have also be very careful because there are also some arteries in the front when, when you're taking this demandioblastoma from the motor trucks. So um, uh, as I told you, uh, the, the key to remove demandioblastomas is do end block resection. At the beginning, you need to um, uh, coagulate the feeding arteries. And after this, you can easily resect the tumor. Interesting detail that mm, the results, the results in treating of uh, chirurgical dinner of demandioblastoma is better than epidemomas and astrocytomas. It's not only in us, it's all around the world. And um, uh, as I told you, probability embolization is okay. If you have a nice endovascular you know, uh, people in uh, your team, it could do this. It's not so easy, but we are very lucky. We were working with a very strong um, endovascular group you know, who help us. Um, for example, in this case of 
lung being the mangioblastoma, mangioblastoma, which is more than four segments, uh, we managed to uh, do do, an, um, do embolization of half of it. Half of it, it was not possible to embolize. And here is the surgery, the same. You do midline incision. Uh, but for the mangioblastoma, it's not for all the time. You have to do midline incision. Sometimes from dress zone, sometimes it is, um, it is, um, uh, from uh, from the part of the tumor that you can see, uh, you can see um, which is going outside of the spinal cord. We do interpretive angiography in this case, and you see that how the tumor is still uh, some blood supply, and so it's better to use the big instruments when you work with the mangioblastoma, not to damage, not to damage it. And um, going around, finding feeling vessels, coagulating them, cutting them. And then you can um, resect it. As I told you, this tumor need to be resect in one piece. So this is one of the longest demangioblastomas that we take out at more than seven, seven, seven centimeters. This is a clothing of the and postoperative angiography showing the total an MRI total resection of this kind of the tumor. This is an article which is describing that the stereotactic radio surgery is very helpful in the cases when the mangioblastoma is not the big one, which is small, and you can stop their growing with the radio surgery. There was this our, our uh, strategy for treating of the mangioblastomas for unsymptomatic observed for uh, radio surgery for symptomatic angiography, um, angiography, um, uh, and uh, gross total resection or embolization and gross total resection. And uh, this is our results in, in um, uh, McCormick scale. And I want to, last two tumors that I want to describe to you, it's a cavernous malformation. This is a nice one meta-analysis and one systematic review in the literature about treating all these kind of the tumors. And the idea, idea is um, uh, from all the um, articles and literature that the chance of growing of um, bleeding from, the, uh, from cavernous malformation uh, for the first time is four to six percent. And because, because of this, um, even these ugly big uh, demandioblastoma uh, cavernous malformations, if they are not bleeding, you don't need um, uh, to go and do the surgery or they leave them alone. We have an experience more than four to four, 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 nine, uh, more than one uh, ninety cases in treatment of cavernous malformation, and um, uh, here is the surgery of the cavernous malformation. The, the, this uh, patient have a, um, uh, has a ble bleeding, uh, and he even he have a severe neurological deficit after this, and he got uh, to intensive care. And after this one, he recovered. We decided to remove, resect it. And as you can see, when we started surgery, it was no, 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 sim, no any uh, signs of any tumor. Uh, and we just go through midline. We split the spinal cord because the cavernous, uh, cavernous malformation was located in front uh, part uh, of the spinal cord. And we do also interpret fungiography. It doesn't play any important role because um, uh, be because uh, it's low flow malformation and, and uh, there's no really blood flow inside of it. So, and uh, why it's need to do the surgery after the first section of cavernous malformation? Because uh, if you have, they have three or four or five bleeding, there's a lot of scar around it. And after this, it will be very difficult to resect it, not damaging the spinal cord. So if you have um, uh, several bleedings, you need to do the sharp dissection. But in these cases, after the first bleeding, it was, we can resect it totally. You can see the big artery in front of us after a section the spinal artery. So now you can understand that we split totally the spinal cord and remove the cavernous malformation, which was in the front part of the, of the, of the spinal cord. And here is postoperative MRI and uh, the patient is doing well right after the surgery with no neurological deficit. So this is our algorithm for cavernous malformation. It's a little bit more heavy and uh, difficult than regular one. Regular is here 
if no bleeding observed, is a bleeding outside the cavernous malformation during the surgery. But also we find out that there is some small bleedings inside the cavernous malformation. If the McCormick is not higher than one, then we can observe. If it's more than two, then we already need to do the surgery. So this is concerning only the bleedings, which is inside the cavernous malformation. This is our results, and um, uh, have, as I mentioned before, we use radio surgery for many kind of intermediate core tumors, especially for the um, metastasis, for example, lung metastasis in the spinal cord. This is before the radio surgery. This is one month, this is 15 months after the surgery, and also with national allergical results. This is my talk to home take messages. I just remind them. So you have to be start to remove epidemomas as um, as fast as possible when they um, just have only slight sim uh, small symptoms. Uh, it's better to do the surgery because it will be safe. But if you um, if um, the tumor is huge and the patient is already in severe neurological deficit, it's sometimes maybe it's better not to remove the total not to do the total resection leave some part of the tumor by prevent neurological deficit and give the patient the chance to live for the uh, few, for future uh, years um, uh, in a good neurological status. Um, you have to rem remember that we, uh, you get the diagnosis of the palatistic astrocytoma, you have to follow, um, you have to follow uh, key 67 uh, and uh, also other genetic parameters. Uh, to understood if it's not a malignant tumor, if it's malignant tumor, send them immediately to radio surgery and chemotherapy. Or no, it's not symptomatic. Uh, not symptomatic hemangioblastomas can pass the radio surgery and cavernous malformation, which is bleeds inside the, uh, in the not inside the malformation, uh, cannot be can be observed. Um, still, McCormick is one. Uh, thank you very much. That's it. for your nice presentation, Dr. Konolov. Really, I'm surprised. Uh, many years ago, I, I, I know your experience at Budenko Center in Russia. And for, for us, very, you have a large experience. We have many questions. Um, one of these is, um, can you say some aspect in relation to prevent the formation in your surgery for intradural tumor? Uh, so we never you, do you, the fusion. We never do the fusion at the very beginning, and you do the. Can you can do the laminoplasty. And you can do the uh, laminectomy. Very accurate. In the kids, for sure, it is laminoplasty. In adult, it doesn't matter. You can do laminoplasty. You can do. You can do. Mm -hmm. A laminectomy, but not so wide. Uh, but if we have the deformation only after the see the deformation of the mm, in a couple of years, it happens very very rare. Then you can do the fusion, but not the fusion at mm, at the beginning of any intermediate core tumors. Tumor. We never fuse intermediate core tumor at the beginning. Also, the same is concerning to the uh, dumbbell bell tumors. For example, we have a huge experience of dumbbell bell tumors. We also never fuse them. We just uh, resect one facet joint, another facet joint, and even all the lumbar level. Surely, it's not if they have a spondylolisthesis in dumbbell bell tumor, it's rare. But in, in the regular non degenerative spine, you can easily resect several of the facets and it will be okay. Okay. And other aspect is uh, for the complication for spinal surgery, one of the most important complications is the CSF fistula. Can mm -hmm. you say something in relation to prevent the fistula in the postoperative? Or, and when do you, ha do you have a fistula? What is your uh, strategy for treatment? Uh, um... You, you usually for intermediate core tumors you can close the dura very good, but in sometimes, especially for example, no, how to prevent it? Uh, just do the good closure of the dura, and then you can use taha comb or the glue over it. So do the sandwich uh, if you're not sure about your stitches, and um, 
there's a special cases when, for example, we have a diffuse astrocytomas when the spinal cord is enlarged and uh, there's no, the, you, if you, when you do the central melatomy, uh, uh, you can find, the, for example, the difference between the spinal cord and the tumor because inside the spinal cord. And in this case, you can do only the biopsy and then you have to do the duraplasty. And in this case, yeah, you really, when you do the duraplasty for, uh, after, after this, you can have some time of preventing of, grow, of growing of neurological deficit and you can send the patient to radio surgery. Uh, and, uh, but uh, in the case of duraplasty, it's really, yes, it's, it's important after this to use the hot comp and, and, uh, and glue to make a sandwich um, uh, to prevent it. If I have a leak um, uh, and you do the revision, if you have a leak, you do the revision surgery. And uh, But if we're leaking of the, um, uh, say, so, but if you have a um, cyst, a postoperative cyst, usually you don't need it. You just absorb it and it will be okay. If it doesn't cause severe neurological problems and the patient the same neurological status. If you see the uh, CSF cyst after the surgery, leave it alone and it will just um, disappear in some time. Thanks. One other question. Uh, also, is, uh... also, what is important, well, also what is important, but it's um, maybe not for, for intermediate core tumors, it's for different cases when I have a really problem with the closure of the dura. Uh, you can put the drainage um, drainage inside the wound uh, to take the CSF out from the wound, and uh, uh, because the main thing is to heal um, to heal the wound. If the wound is healed, then you take your drainage away. Even if there will be the cyst, there will no be leakage of the CSF, and you are also okay. This is also possible. Thanks. Uh, do you for for when you open the milotomy uh, for take off the the tumor? Do do you close the milotomy? Yes, no. In, in the case if in, you in do all total, case, no, no. If you do total resection, for sure we we'll close it. We we'll put not not many stitches, but we put some to prevent of scarring of the spinal cord inside part of spinal cord to the dura. We do this, but in the case if I do, you know, for example, gemangioblastomas, it's not possible to close them because there is a huge distance between the borders of the spinal cord. And also in the case if I have a, if I don't remove the tumor totally, I also don't close it to make some space for growing of the tumor. You you have in some case with. Uh the patient with a real very bad condition neurological condition we don't yeah. have the possibility to to walk to eat something and you do have you find a in, intra or sea, a tendinoma in the cervical zone so so do you think it's useful is use useful the the surgery or no, if, the, if, the patient, if the patient is near to die, surely not useful for the surgery because uh, okay. you just only you're going to kill it. It's better not to the people not to die on your operation at the range of table, for sure. But but sometimes it happens that you see the patients which is just near to die, and um, I think it's just you know already the to, to, um, you know, no place for the surgery, but. Still, in some cases, when you can be understood, you can do decompression, you can do some debulking, and you can prolong his life, it's okay. No, not, not do the total removing, you can do partial removing, you can do duroplasty, and just you can prolong the life of the patient. And, and one case, question in relation to the metastasis at the spinal cord. Mm -hmm. Do you think the best treatment is the is, is some type of radiotherapy, or in some case with you have a cancer um, with a good control, no lesion in other place? Do you do you think some surgery? Uh, this is depends on the kind of the of the metastasis. It depends if the, if this metastasis um. Uh, treating by chemotherapy it's also okay mm -hmm. uh, because this was very difficult to remove 
um, it's impossible to remove metastasic to totally. So maybe sometimes it's better if you know the already histological um, diagnosis, maybe to do, do go to radio surgery. It's also good because uh, you can remove the part and go to radio surgery, or you can go directly to radio surgery. Or the, uh, there will be the benefit from the chemotherapy if the, um, if this metast if the, this disease is responsible for chemotherapy. Thanks so much. Thank you, Professor Suresh. Uh, Raja, very nice talk, Professor Conello. You covered everything. Thousand cases of intramedullary tumor. What a great experience from your center. Couple of comments. Couple of uh, questions. First thing is, you know, you covered ependymoma, astrocytoma, hemangioblastoma, and cavernomas. Uh, but, you know, my first question is, you know, the initial part of this last series, probably your institute would not have uh, used this monitoring, evoke potential, motor evoke potential, and uh, D wave. And later series, definitely you would have used, and you didn't show the results of your ependymoma, astrocytoma. Uh, they, uh, with monitoring, without monitoring, and you uh, mostly you were in uh, telling us the technical details. But as this monitoring uh, helped you in preventing or stopping surgery. First question. Second question is more important. You highlighted very well the 2021 WHO classification for uh, uh, for astrocytoma. How it has changed. You know, similarly. A 2021 ependymomas also have come because you know spinal ependymomas they have uh, one is with the nf2 uh, mutations which are relatively benign and there is spinal ependymoma with myc and amplification which are bad and i saw your slide standard treatment i also never used to send a spinal ependymoma after surgery for radiation and you told that subtotally weight and see if they progress, then you will send for uh, radiation. And you told it is all uh, level of evidence C, class two, that also I agree. I also used to do the same thing, but now molecular wise, they have found that NF2 mutated ones, they do very well. You can hold on even if you do something residual, you leave. While MIC and amplified things, you should give upfront radiation. Unlike intracranial ependymomas where everybody we used to send for radiation, whether it is YAP or S FTA or PFA, B or A, everybody goes for radiation. Spinal, we will never used to send. So your thoughts on this and also your monitoring pre and post monitoring era. Uh, Professor Connello. Yeah, what was the first question? It was about, uh, do we need a monitoring? Uh, during yeah, that I agree, it has to be monitored, but you had a, you have a large series of thousand cases. Initial part of your series, definitely, there would not have been this monitoring. So do you find this monitoring has really helped in preventing oh. deficits for your cases? No, we have to use, uh, according to the law, we have to use near monitoring for all intermediate court, case, uh, court cases. This is according for the law. But uh, in each cases, when I do some, some uh, manipulation, which I think can be harmful for the spinal cord, I ask to measure the monitoring because I'm always looking at it. Even in, if, if, even in the case of gemangioblastoma, when I know that I have to resect it, in one, one I can stop. There is only one way of the surgery is resected and one block. There's also you need to um, uh, have your manner of monitoring because, for example, you can increase increase um, uh, steroids. You can use uh, warm water. If you see the falling of your monitor near monitoring, you can just say, simply ask the nurse to bring the hot water and put the hot water on the spinal cord and it recover the spinal cord. And maybe you might be, be less, a little bit less aggressive. If you see that this way of the dissecting of the demand your blastoma, destroy your money, your money, your potentials, you just can be less aggressive and more accurate. What is the second question? I, I, do, any, second I, I do any genetic studies for ependymoma. Maybe it will be very interesting because I find out in my experience that you know, not about uh, follow-up, but about even um, uh, the structure of epidemomas grade two, they're totally different, they're totally different 
uh, uh, kind of tissue in ependymomas grade two, which is different from one tumor to another. One is have a very nice borders, very easy to resect. Another is very stick to spinal cord, and it is really only you can do the sharp dissection. And the same or the same for gemangioblastomas, because some gemangioblastomas is very difficult to damage, and there is very rare bleeding from it. And, but in someone, even if they are small, they're bleeding, they are very, very soft and easily, easily to damage. So I think in future, in future, there will be more and more classification, even in, in these groups. Maybe it's not interesting for all the surgeons, but for people who are dealing each day with this intermediate core tumor for us, it will be important what kind of grade two ependymoma or what kind of gemangioblastoma we have in the genetic field, yeah. Totally agree with you. Sure. I absolutely agree. And lastly, I have to congratulate you for teaching us about uh, checking metabolic activity using laser spectroscopy and all, which we have never done. And nice information and congratulations. This Thank is you. this is very interesting because when you finish to remove your pindemoma, it's always like a uh, round in front, sometimes round in front of you, which is stick to the motor tracks and you don't know to remove it or not. If it's not active, you can leave it. And we leave a lot, uh, this is like, um, you can also do, for example, if there's some metabolic activity, you can put your cooser on one and just um, sh sh shaved it a little bit. And when um, uh, there's this, oh, there's always some tissue is left in the front of a bendemoma, the tissue from which the vessels are coming to it and feeding it. So there's um, not uh, always the nice border in front of a bendemoma. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much. We can invite comments from Professor Shubin. Okay, great, great. Thank you, uh, Professor Nicola. Thank you. So, Podenko uh, Neurological Center is very nice, the biggest one in Russia, and uh, it's also very famous in China. And mm -hmm. actually, we yeah. have uh, uh, your colleague, uh, Dr. Uh, Anna Shuajina. Mm -hmm. She come here, uh, followed me for the bypass training. No. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Tonight we have a, around the 950 audience in the WeChat channel. How many? Listen to your one, uh, 950. Okay, good. Yeah, 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 yeah. Very good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Good. Thank you. Thank you for your Thank nice you. presentation. Yeah. But, uh, I think. Uh, a lot of very challenging cases in your presentation, especially the uh, neck and the propaganda ones. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We indeed had a wonderful session and what a great series. We can take the final comments from our chair, Professor Valdivia, before we close this session. Thanks for the invitation. Really, I, I enjoyed this time with uh, this is a magic world when when you have the possibility to to learn from the Russia, from mm. China, from India, for different countries. Uh, I hope you have a good time now, and see you see you. I, I hope in a presential meeting. And in South America, you can find a very nice country, very nice time, and you have. I, I hope we have the, the possibility to, to now uh, your presentation here in Chile. Thanks. Thank you. Well, Thank you. Well, Thank you very much. I'll close this officially on behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President of the Yoko Kaito. I would like to thank both speakers of today, Professor Nicholas Bambakidis and Professor Nikolai Konvalov, as well as the chairs, Professor Rukuya Tanikawa and Professor Felipe Valdivia for the time and support for the ACNS webinars. I would like to express my sincere thanks to Professor Shubin for broadcasting this on the WeChat channel. And as he mentioned, we have around 950 people who have joined us live. So until we meet on Saturday, it is bye-bye from all of us. Thank you very much for joining.